Welcome to the February 2022 Oregon Archaeological Society monthly meeting. Uh, we want to, to introduce tonight's speaker, Caitlin McDonough, and I'm going to ask Dan Stuber to introduce Caitlin. He's a friend and a colleague, and he knows much more about uh, her research. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Caitlin McDonough received her Bachelor's of Science degree at the University of Oregon and her PhD in anthropology at the Center for the Study of the First Americans at the Texas A&M University. Currently, she's a postdoctoral scholar with the Great Basin Paleo Research Unit at the University of Nevada, Reno. Her research investigates the relationship between people food waste and environment in Western North America, with an emphasis on plant use and landscape change during the Pleistocene-Holocene transition. She has worked at many sites, including the Paisley Caves, and is co-director with Dr. Dennis Jenkins of the Archaeology Field School at the Conley Caves in Central Oregon. Caitlin is a widely published researcher, and you can find many of her publications on academia.edu. She's the editor, along with Richard Rosencrantz and Jordan Pratt, of a new volume, which is in publication by the University of Utah Press, entitled Current Perspectives on Stemmed and Fluted Point Technologies in the American Far West. I've had the pleasure of working with Caitlin, as Jim mentioned, and to hear her present. So I know you're in for a really special treat uh, with tonight's presentation, Sowing Seeds and Stones life in the Pleistocene at the Conley Caves, Oregon. Please welcome Dr. Caitlin McDonough. And before we get started, I would ask everyone to turn their um, mute button on and to shut down your video because it makes for a much better recording of Caitlin's talk. So I'm gonna do the same thing. So mute the uh, audio and uh, turn the video off. You can Okay, uh, can everyone see my slide? Am I sharing it correctly? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you so much. And hopefully you can hear me all right as well. If there's any issues with that, just speak up and let me know, please. Um, if it's okay to go ahead and get started, yeah. Um, thank you so much, Dan, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. I've had the pleasure and honor to work with Dan on multiple projects now, um, and that's been fantastic. And uh, I also would like to thank the Oregon Archaeological Society for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm really honored to be here, and um, thank you to everyone who has organized all of this. And uh, thank you all for taking the time to tune in. And I'm just going to move something around on my screen real quick here. OK. Um, all right, so tonight I'm really excited to be sharing some updates on what we have been up to at the Conley Caves um, for the last seven years now. And I'm really going to focus on what we've been learning about life in the Pleistocene, specifically with regard to sowing seeds and stones, that is stone tools. So um, the Conley Caves are a series of rock shelters that are situated on the traditional lands of the Klamath and the Modoc and Northern Paiute people in Central Oregon. And people have actually been coming to this, this site and using these shelters for nearly 13,000 years, resulting in a really long and incredible history of site use there. But today I'm really just gonna focus on some of those earlier periods of site use before about 11,700 years ago. And here's kind of our trajectory for the evening and some of the big questions that I wanna cover. So what led us to the Conley Caves? Why and how are we doing research there? Um, I'll also go over what we've been doing and learning in caves four and five, which is where we've really been focused since 2014. 
And um, finally, I'll talk about how this is all contributing to bigger pictures and questions about life in the Pleistocene and end with a little update on what we're up to now and what you can expect um, ahead. So this is where the Conlin Caves are located in the beautiful Fort Rock Basin in Central Oregon. Uh, there's actually a really long history of archeological work here. Um, some of which I'll touch on tonight in answering our first question, which is what led us to the Conley Caves? And to fully answer that question, I'm actually gonna take it back to um, early archeology span and early ideas of what was going on during the terminal Pleistocene. And an image that comes to a lot of people's minds when they think about this time is uh, this, um, Clovis points. These are very distinct fluted projectile points um, that were first recognized in the 1920s and 1930s at Blackwater Draw in New Mexico, where their remains were associated with, uh, with mammoths. And um, this was some of the earliest evidence that we had that people were here during the Ice Age and coexisted with these now extinct megafauna. And we now understand that Clovis dates back to about uh, 13,400 to 12,700 years ago, depending on who you ask, there is debate about that time frame. Um, but we do understand that it dates to around this time. And then a little bit later, we see another type of fluted point come into use around 12,800 years ago. This is called Folsom. And um, instead of being associated with mammoths and mastodons, they're, they're more associated with bison hunting because this is a little later on when the mammoths and the mastodons are no longer with us. Um, so this is a kind of a very abbreviated background for why Clovis and fluted points and, and large some now extinct mammals are things that people think about a lot when they think about the Pleistocene. Um, however, while this whole picture was coming together that I just described, there were archaeologists working in the far west and in the Great Basin who were finding something else in the earliest sites in those areas. And these are stemmed points. So archaeologists like Luther Cressman in Oregon, um, <clears throat> the Campbells down the Mojave, and later Stephen Bedwell, who I'll mention tonight, um, Alan Bryan, Ruth Grune, and others, found stem points. And in the Great Basin, they noticed that these points were often along the margins of pluvial lake shores. And in the 1930s, Luther Cressman, um, working in, at the Paisley Caves, argued that there were people um, who were living at the Paisley Caves 13,000 years ago. Well, actually, just that they were living there and coexisting with megafauna. And then later, Luther Cressman's student, Stephen Bedwell, proposed that people at Conley Caves were there 13,000 years ago and using STEM technology. So these claims were really tantalizing, but they were questioned for a really long time by archaeologists due to the expedient nature of these early excavations and a lack of really precise provenance information for the association of dates and the tools. But we do now see that stem points are indeed this old overlapping with and possibly predating Clovis. And recent work by um, Lauren Davis at Cooper's Ferry found stem points dating between about 13,500 and 13,200 years ago. And work by Dennis Jenkins at the Paisley Caves found stem points dating to around 13,100 years ago. And then around 12,600 years ago, we see this very distinct type of stem point. They're shoulderless and they're called haskets and they come into use around 12,600 years ago. And we see a lot of this at the Conley Caves. So you're gonna hear me saying hasket uh, more this evening. And hasket overlaps in time with Folsom, but unlike Folsom, what we're seeing now is that people who are making these hasket points um, sometimes had quite broad diets that included large game, but also a variety of other things. So all of this little intro is really just to say that it's very clear now that life, technology, society, subsistence, all these things were really a lot more complex um, in the Pleistocene than archaeologists previously appreciated, and we have a lot left to learn. Um, 
And as Dan mentioned, thank you, Dan, for <laughs> plugging the book. I also wanted to mention it. This is actually under review right now with the University of Utah Press, but we, um, me and my colleagues and a bunch of other researchers, it's a 14 chapter book, um, are looking at this through a technological lens and seeing what's going on with stemmed and fluted technology. So I really look forward to being able to share this with everybody someday and hopefully the near future. There is a chapter by um, OAS's very own Dan Stuber and his colleague Darren Duke about Haskets and it's great. So stay tuned for that. But tonight I'm actually gonna be talking about a very specific part of the Pleistocene, a period called the Younger Dryas, which is named for uh, this little Alpine Dryas flower. And um, the Younger Dryas was a cold period between about 12,900 and 11,700 years ago. And by this time, those iconic megafauna that I was talking about were extinct and a lot of the pluvial lakes over here in this map were beginning to recede. And we know that it was significantly cooler, probably on the order of about nine degrees Fahrenheit cooler due to a number of climatic proxies, the cutest of which I would argue is the pica. And we recently actually dated some pica remains from the Conley Caves to 12,500 years ago. So um, this tells us it's a lot cooler because in addition to being very adorable, pikas are also very heat sensitive and they can't withstand prolonged temperatures of above of around 85 degrees. So them being at the caves definitely suggests it's cooler. They're not in the area any longer. Um, yeah, so the recent research at Conlin Caves, as well as some surrounding sites in the area, are showing that um, people were using the shelters a lot during the Younger Dryas period and were really active in the broader North Great ba Northern Great Basin during this time. So here's the location of the Conley Caves, as well as a few nearby sites that I've mentioned or will mention later in the talk. So we have the Paisley Caves just um, down to the southeast there in the Shewakan Basin. And we know that people were there by about 14,000 years ago based on directly dated coprolites, which is a fancy word for very old poop. And it contained human DNA and human biomarkers and there's associated artifacts as well. Um, and then we know that people were using STEM technology at the Paisley Caves by at least 13,000 years ago. Then up here in, in the Fort Rock Basin, just within a day's walk of Conley Caves, we have a site called Cougar Mountain Cave. And um, this site was actually excavated by a local person in the 1950s. And most of the materials are now in a private museum. But recent work by Rosencrantz and colleagues dated some braided cordage from the collection to about 12,100 years ago. And um, ongoing collaborative work between the University of Oregon and the University of Nevada, Reno is currently looking at some sewn leather from these lower components at the site that may be younger dryas in age. There's also Fort Rock Cave, which in a, within a day's walk of Conley Caves. Uh, you may know the site, it's quite well known because of these sagebrush sandals, which are actually the oldest footwear in the world. But there are also hasket points at Fort Rock Cave. So people were probably stopping by this site as well during the Younger Dryas. So here we're zooming in and you can see the outline of the Fort Rock Basin here and the location of the Conley Caves in the Silver Lake Subbasin where they're overlooking Paulina Marsh. And Paulina Marsh is the only place that receives perennial stream flow today. This is what it looks like if you're standing at the shelters looking out over Paulina Marsh. So this is the only place that stays well watered year round and it therefore is important habitat for plants and animals and of course people. So Stephen Bedwell first excavated the Conley Caves in the 1960s and here you can see him down in cave four, which is where he found buried western stemmed assemblages and charcoal that returned dates of over 13,000 years ago. However, the purported association of the dates and the artifacts has been debated and questioned due to a lack of very pre precise provenience information about where they came from. So in 2000, Dennis Jenkins returned to the site with the University of Oregon Field School and uh, confirmed that there were intact deposits there. And then after a hiatus while he was working at the Paisley Caves, Dennis returned to Conley in 2014. And that's when I got involved. And we've been returning there basically every summer since with the University of Oregon Field School. 
We first worked in um, K4 and then in K5, which I will discuss in turn now. So what have we learned? Um, we're gonna start here. This is K4 and we worked here between 2014 and 2017. And this is what K4 looks like if you're looking straight on and on the right is the interior when the field school students were working there in 2017. You can see it's a pretty small shelter, only about three meters wide and four meters deep. And here is a um, plan view map of K4. So the gray, uh, the gray squares with the numbers are excavation units um, from the U of O excavations. And then the large red squares are where Stephen Bedwell excavated in the 1960s. And through our, our field work, as well as through working with the legacy collection, we were able to delineate where Bedwell excavated, relocate his datum, and even redate some of the features that he recorded and sampled in the 1960s. And so all of this has allowed us to integrate our data sets. So the earliest very clear cultural component in K4 dates to between about 12,700 and 12,500 years ago. And it includes a range of tools that you can see here. So we have projectile points, which are shown in red. We have cores shown in purple. Scrapers are in blue, and then there's the little bits of stone um, that gets chipped away when tools are being produced, which we call debitage, and those are the little gray dots there. Um, and so notice, there's a couple things I want to point out here. Um, first is that these points, they do appear to be part of the Western STEM tradition. They do appear to be STEM points. Um, however, some of them don't really perfectly fit within the defined styles of, of STEM styles. And so this is pretty interesting. I also wanted to note that two of them, um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, uh, are and also this core over here are made of not obsidian, but of this fine grained basalt. And this material, this fine grained basalt that we're calling Conley Hills FGV is actually found right in the Conley Hills eroding um, in these cobble packages just within 300 meters of the site. Um, and so we're able to see here with the tools and with the core and the debitage that people were actually procuring tool stone right in the hills and making it into tools there. Overall, the small number of, of artifacts and um, the different types of tools represented suggest that this is probably a short visit in which people engage in activities like tool production. We then have another period of site use between about 12,500 and 12,200 years ago in which a larger number and wider diversity of tools were discarded. So we have quite a few scrapers, cores, and we also have osseous technology, including bone needles and this, um, artiodactyl tooth that has been carved with parallel lines on both sides. All the projectile points here are Haskett style, and it looks like this is probably a longer stay. Um, it's either a longer stay or it could be a palimpsest of multiple um, visits that occurred right after each other, in which people engaged in tool making but also sewing. And it's also around this time, remember, that we were able to date that pica bone. So we know that it was cooler around this time. And the component I want to spend a bit more time on tonight dates to about 12,300 years ago, and it has an absolutely astounding volume of tools. Nearly all of the 40 projectile points are Haskett style. There's also over 100 scrapers and around 60 modified flakes. So all of this is suggesting that people were doing some serious intensive processing activities. And we think that this could possibly be a sewing camp or a place where people would gather to process hides, um, to make leather items to survive the cold winter. Um, things like clothing, possibly. And ethnographically, groups such as the Inuit would congregate in the fall to process caribou hides. And it was the women who were the skilled seamstresses and and um, the skilled people processing the hides and making the clothing. So archeologist Alan Osborne proposed that sewing technology was linked to clothing production and was an adaptive response to cold stress during the Younger Dryas. 
And this component in K4 meets many of the expectations that he laid out for what a camp like this should look like archaeologically. For instance, the volume and the diversity of tools suggests that this was a longer stay than just a brief stopover. There also may have been some activity areas. For instance, we have a concentration of scrapers and cores at the mouth of the cave. And then there's hearths, the bedwell recorded towards the back, which we recently redated to 12,300 years ago. There's also needles, gravers, abraders, cutting knives, ochre, and some possibly associated tools like this tooth that has parallel lines carved and a hole carved at the top of it. And the scrapers that we've had analyzed for protein have returned matches for hide bearing animals like mountain sheep and elk. There's also connections that we're seeing between Conley Caves and other sites in the area that are telling us about toolstone use, toolkits, sewing technology, and mobility. So this is a representative figure of tools um, that could have been used for hide processing. Most of them are from Conley Caves, but there are um, some uh, hasket points and bone needles from Cougar Mountain and Paisley Cave as well. Hasket technology is actually found at all three of these sites. And these points could have been used to hunt hide bearing mammals, but they also could have been used to process the hides used as knives. And um, we also have bone needles at all three of these sites. And one of our field school students, Itzel Quiras, actually used a microscope to measure the openings at, of the eye or the measurements of the eye of the needles and compared that to the um, measurements of the spurs on the gravers. And she found that they matched really well. So it is possible that the gravers were being used to make these um, eyed bone needles. And then I just wanted to point out, remember that FGV I was talking about that's available in cobbles right in the Conley Hills. We are seeing that not only at the Conley Caves, but also at um, Cougar Mountain Cave. And likewise, Cougar Mountain Obsidian is one of the primary sources that we see used at the Conley Caves. So it really looks like the same group um, or groups of people are visiting both sites. And our research, um, our collaborative research group with UNR and U of O is uh, working with the legacy collection from Cougar Mountain Cave uh, to possibly see, get a glimpse of what it was people were making. So what you're looking at here are strips of leather on the left, including a big wad of leather string. Some of these leather pieces have knots in them. And then on the right is a piece of leather that actually has stitching in it. And we're currently working to date and to identify the materials here. But recently, U of O um, PhD candidate Elizabeth Kallenbach identified some of the stitching as bast fiber. So the inner bark surrounding the stem of some plants like dogbane and nettle. Um, so this is actually a composite piece made of both plant and animal materials. And um, these materials are reported to have been from the lower levels at Cougar Mountain Cave. And if that's the case, they should date to the Younger Dryas. And that would be to our knowledge, the oldest dated leather that we're aware of in the world. So thanks to work carried out in the last 15 years throughout the Northern Great Basin and other areas of the Great Basin, we're actually now able to start filling in some of these blank areas in Alan Osborne's 2014 map with the addition of some more younger Dryas Age sites that have sewing technology. So in addition to Conley Caves, we also um, have Paisley Caves to add, Weed Lake Ditch towards the east in Oregon, um, Cougar Mountain Cave also in Oregon, and then we have Tule Lake Rock Shelter in California and Sentinel Gap up in Washington. And these emerging patterns are really interesting and they're revealing new aspects of people's lives in the Younger Dryas. And I'm going to revisit this map and some of these similarities between these sites a little bit later in my discussion of Cave 5, which we will get into now. Okay, so while Cave 4 is telling us a lot about people's tool technologies, um, Cave 5 is providing a complementary view and really telling us a lot about people's food ways. So Cave 5 is located just around the corner from Cave 4, um, and our excavation block was actually within 
an overhang here at the mouth of cave five. And this is what that area looked like in 2019 before we closed, closed the area. And here you can see there's a faint white line here on the rock shelter wall. That's actually Mount Mazama Tephra. So about 7,650 year old tephra adhering to the rock shelter wall. And then below this here is um, gypsum, which corresponds to the younger driest levels. So everything I'm about to talk about was below that second arrow there. And then at the base, you can see the rounded cobbles from when Pluvial Fort Rock Lake was actually coming up into the shelters. So here's that excavation block when the students were excavating the Younger Dryas components. And then this figure shows the stratigraphy in that area. So within those stratified layers are hearth features or places where people had fires and possibly cooked or engaged in other activities. And I was absolutely ecstatic about these features because they can tell you so much about what people were doing, and especially about what I study, which is food, and specifically plant foods. And I was ecstatic about this, not only because I love food and studying what people eat, but also because our current view of Pleistocene life in North America and what people were eating then is really heavily biased toward faunal data. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of debate about what people were doing during this time with some researchers arguing that people were specialized big game hunters, whereas other people are suggesting that some groups had broad, flexible diets. So what you're looking at here is a map of Pleistocene archaeological sites in temperate North America with um, dietary data that's been recovered. And the red indicates faunal data only. The blue are sites that have faunal and botanical data. So overall, 90% of these sites are red. And of the blue sites, we can zoom into those real quick. Starting with the oldest, we have Paisley Caves, um, where hearths dating back to 13,000 years ago contained plants like charred seeds of grasses, goosefoot, kinoams, mustards, phacelia, borges, and charred tissue of geophytes. There's also younger driest age coprolites that contain cattail seeds, um, cattail pollen, rose fruits, and phytolis. And the phytolis are showing us that people were regularly eating leafy greens, which is so cool because you can barely ever see things like that in the archeological record. There's also a polished stone dating to about 13,700 years ago that yielded carrot family and grass seeds, starches, and phytolis. Over in the east, we have hearths from the Clovis component at Shawnee Mini Sink dating to around 12,900 years ago. And these hearths contained hawthorn fruits and hickory nuts. And then in Nevada, we have Bonneville Estates Rock Shelter where there's a whole series of hearths spanning the Younger Dryas and they contain things like charred cactus parts and small seeds from grasses, goosefoot, sunflower, bulrush, mustards, and cattail seeds. Though the cattail may be related to um, the use of fluff as fire starter. Then returning to the east, we have Dust Cave in Alabama, where beginning around 12,500 years ago, people using Beaver Lake and Dalton technology consumed a variety of nuts like hickory, walnut, acorn, and hazelnut, as well as berries and possibly some kenopodium seeds. And then finally in Utah, um, Darren Duke and colleagues analyzed an open air hearth. It's actually the oldest open air hearth in the Great Basin, um, has associated hasket points. It's called the Wishbone Site. And they recovered um, the seeds of red maids, pit seed, goosefoot, and tobacco. And they recently had a really big paper come out about this because this is the earliest evidence for human use of tobacco ever. So these places are revealing a whole new aspect of people's food ways and their lives that was just previously unrecognized. In the Great Basin, just in the last 15 years, we've gone from having zero to three sites with plant data. And today we're gonna to go ahead and add a fourth with new data from the Conley Caves. And I am excited to share as well that our paper on this recently came out and it's available open access through American Antiquity. So anyone can download it. Um, I can also send you a copy if you're interested, but I'm gonna give you an abbreviated version of what we found here. Uh, tonight. So from the features that I was talking about before, we found over 700 charred seeds, including at least 21 unique plant taxa, 18 of which are edible plants used by Great Basin indigenous groups. 
And the morphology and the contents of each of these features was actually really different and each one told kind of a unique story. So I'm gonna briefly summarize each of those now, beginning with the oldest. So down here, we have feature one, which is around 12,500 years old. You can see its shape um, from above on the left. So it, it's cut in half because we only excavated half of it. And on to the right of that image, you can see what it looked like in cross section. So it's a bowl shaped, um, a bowl shaped hearth. And then the bar graphs here are showing the average number of seeds, debitage and fish that it contained per liter. So this particular feature with only two seeds per liter actually isn't telling us a whole lot about plant use. However, the associated tool assemblage is very robust and it includes broken and reworked hasket style points. So um, this suggests that the event related to this feature probably had to do with activities like retooling and possibly hunting. Feature two is around 12,000 years old and um, I refer to it here as a combustion area because the original hearth is no longer clearly defined. And this feature has really high seed density and diversity, including at least eight species of dryland plants and two wetland taxa, <clears throat> as well as some very small fragments of what looked like charred plant tissue. So all of this tells us that people gathered plants from multiple habitats and this was likely during the summer and possibly into the fall. And inside the feature, I also found a fragment of a partially charred bone needle. Um, <clears throat> and there were um, associated hasket points. Um, among the associated artifacts were three pieces of ground stone that Jamie Kennedy at U of O is currently analyzing for starch grains. So it's very exciting. And then I also wanna point out this other, um, this other artifact here, this is, um, made of bone. We're not completely sure what this is, but very similar items have been found at other younger Dryas Age sites elsewhere in the Great Basin and also on the plateau. So here we are coming back to that map of Pleistocene sites with sewing technology. And in addition to the Conley Caves, very similar bone items have been found at three other sites. So we have Weed Link Ditch to the east in Oregon, Bonneville Estates in Nevada, and Sentinel Gap up in Washington. So together, we're seeing some really interesting similarities between the young, between younger Dryas Age sites and this pretty broad geographic area. Now returning for the last two features, we have feature three, which is 11,800 years old. This is a hearth area because it includes this rock lined um, hearth area with some charcoal extending out to the side. And the hearth contents also included a wide variety of seeds, but these were all dryland plants. There was no indication of wetland use here. Associated technology included a number of hasket points and debitage density was really high with around 500 pieces per liter. So all of this is suggesting a different type of site use, possibly due to different foraging goals slightly later in the year, closer to late fall. And then lastly, we have feature four, which is an intact hearth dating to technically the earliest Holocene around 11,500 years ago. And it has a really high seed density with wetland and dryland taxa represented, uh, suggesting that this was a summer or fall use of the shelter. Uh, I also found over 200 fish vertebra per liter, which further suggests that people were visiting and using the wetlands. And then there was also this unusual bone artifact in association, in association with the harp. Um, and this could be part of a composite fishing hook. So this is, if you can see my uh, arrow here, hopefully this is the, what we actually found. And this is just a modern example of a composite fishing hook. So it could be possible also fishing. Um, then I also just want to point out that the projectile point styles are changing here. So there, it's a lot more gracile form of stem point that we're starting to see at this time. Oh yes, and very last thing, this is a very interesting feature. Um, there was another piece of, a, of an eyed bone needle. This time it was just the tiny bit that broke at the eye. Um, and then you can see it in a pill case in my hand for scale here. So there's a couple of really cool things about these data. So first, um, nearly all, nearly half of the taxa that uh, we interpret as economic from the Conley Caves 
have actually been found at other younger driest age sites in the Great Basin. So this is a comparison of those sites that I talked about earlier. And um, all of them contain different types of kinoams, so things like goosefoot and saltbush. Um, <clears throat> three of the four yielded seeds of grasses and mustards. And then uh, small amounts of wetland taxa were at three of the sites, especially cattail is showing up quite a lot. And edible tissue is also pretty common. The second thing is that we are able to add some new plant food items to the Pleistocene menu. So things like seepweed, peppergrass, buckwheat, and possibly blazing star mallow and violet. Interestingly, the pattern that we're seeing at these sites in, in the Great Basin is a lot different than what we're seeing at the sites further east like Shawnee Mini Sink and Dust Cave, which are really dominated by nut mass and fruits. So whether these differences are driven by variability in regional resources, taphonomic issues, um, sampling and recovery strategies, cultural preferences, um, you know, it could be many things. It's likely a combination of things, but this is going to take a lot more investigation um, at a continental scale to parse this out, as well as more plant data. So these are questions that I'm really looking forward to working on in the future. So what does all of this tell us about life in the Pleistocene at Conley Caves, but also in the Northern Great Basin um, more broadly? So to begin, I know that was a ton of information that I just shared about Conley Caves. So <clears throat> to bring everything together here, I have a little visual summary of the major components that we're interpreting at the Conley Caves. So if we start at the bottom here, we actually do have some very sparse artifacts um, below all the components that I just talked about. And there's also um, radiocarbon dates that we've gotten on charcoal from those levels that date around 13,000 years ago. So we have replicated those early dates from Stephen Bedwell. However, their association with the artifacts and whether those dates are actually representing when people first used the site is something that we are actively investigating. So it's possible, but we are not quite certain yet. Then if we continue up here, we have um, component one, which includes stem points that don't perfectly fit into the Western stem styles. Um, and then this is also around the time when we know it's cold because of our pica friend. And around 12,500 years ago, um, we know that people were getting to cohabitate with those adorable pica creatures because they keep coming back to the caves and leaving Haskett style projectile points. And eventually a little after sometime around 12,300, 12,500 years ago, they're also sewing while visiting the caves. And then around 12,300 years ago is when we have that really robust assemblage with over a hundred scrapers suggesting that cave four could have been um, maybe a sewing camp. At the very least, it was a location where people engaged in really serious processing activities. And then of course, over in cave five, we have hearths that are really helping us narrow down the season of these visits. They're showing us that people revis revisited um, the caves during the summer and fall months multiple times, that they went and gathered plants in both dryland and wetland settings, although not always both at the same time. Um, and altogether, our interdisciplinary research here is just really aiming to try to refine and develop a really detailed look at what's going on at the site, but also contribute more broadly to what we know about people's lives in the Pleistocene and the people who were making these Western STEM toolkits. So when we consider what we're learning from the Conley Caves in conjunction with other sites in the area, we're starting to understand aspects uh, that were previously unrecognized. So, you know, we've always known that people who called the high desert home during the Pleistocene lived full, vibrant lives, but we haven't always had the physical evidence to see the details of those lives. And now it's exciting to look at, you know, the Paisley Caves. We can see not only the age of the tools that were being made here, but we can also see um, an array of delicate textiles and we can literally reconstruct 
specific meals that people consumed 12,000 years ago. And then at Cougar Mountain Cave, we see the people's material culture also included sewn leather. And in some cases, it was even um, mixed material pieces with plant fibers being used to stitch the leather. And at Conley Caves, we have found delicate tiny bone needles and we can determine even the season that it was when someone dropped that needle and um, also get a look at the plants that they were cooking in the hearts. So the plant food record from the Conley Caves is really fitting well with other sites like Paisley, Wishbone, Bonneville, and showing us that people had really deep and vast relationships and knowledge of plants going, you know, back to the Pleistocene and further back than that. And we see that in addition to roots, fruits, seeds, cacti, um, people were also eating leafy greens. And they were also um, using a wide range of animals too, from large game to small game, fish and birds. So this, these are really um, diverse, flexible diets that we're seeing here. And I just think it's really incredible to be able to see these details of life um, you know, of people's lives from so long ago, and still to know that there is so much to learn and to understand about this time. So we have a lot of ongoing work happening at the Conley Caves. Um, one of the most important things that we're focusing on is discussion and collaboration with indigenous communities whose traditional lands we are privileged to be working on. Um, you know, this is their cultural heritage and their perspectives and their interests are really critical. Um, we have a range of studies going on. So we have, um, starting from the smallest here, we have some people looking at DNA from the sediments in order to see what plants and animals were around through time. Um, we're also looking at pollen to reconstruct past vegetation in the area. We're looking at starches on the surface of tools to see if those tools were used in plant processing. Um, we're also taking microscopic microscopic looks at the sediment itself in these thin sections to be able to understand um, the details of site formation processes. Um, I'm also doing some more macrobotanical studies. We have several really exciting faunal projects in the works and an in-depth lithic technological study that's going to not only look at what types of tools people were using, but also considering the decisions that they made while they were producing those tools. So I'm really excited about all this work that's happening. It's definitely a very big collaborative effort with a, with a really great research team. And um, I'm really lucky to be a part of that. And our field school is currently ongoing. The applications are open for the summer if you're interested on the U of O website. And um, we're actually working in cave six now. We just started there last year. And I think that we'll be there for two more years and then we'll probably be done for the foreseeable future at the Conley Caves. So that is the state of what is going on and mostly what I had for this evening. But I do want to acknowledge, well, there's a ton of people <laughs> to acknowledge. Um, of course, I want to thank the Klamath, Modoc, and Northern Paiute peoples whose lands we're, we're working on. Um, Bill Cannon and Carolyn Temple of the Bureau of Land Management who have facilitated this work and are really supportive. The University of Oregon Museum of Natural and Cultural History, that is how the field school runs and they support us in everything we do. Um, my uh, co-PIs and the field directors here, we have Dennis Jenkins, who's co-director of um, research and field school here, Richie Rosencrantz, who's the field director, uh, Justin Holcomb, our geoarchaeologist, and we're now partnering with Jeff Smith at University of Nevada, Reno and his graduate students moving forward. We have a bunch of collaborators doing really cool research, everyone listed here, including several of our past field school students who have gone on to do their own research. Um, and I just wanna thank all the field school students and volunteers who have done a lot of this physical work and continue to help us throughout the rest of the process. And of course, this would not be possible without all of the funding that we've received. Um, so I'm really grateful to all the organizations and individuals who have financially supported this work. And um, lastly, I want to thank you for all of your time this evening. 
Uh, I would really love to hear any questions you have. If you have them now, that's great. If you think of them later, feel free to email me anytime. I love talking about archaeology, if you didn't notice. So feel free to shoot me an email. You can also get in touch with me all these ways and read about the field school. So uh, yeah, that is all I really have for this evening. And I'd be happy to hear about your questions and what you think. Well, fantastic, thank you. So it looks like we did have one question come through the chat. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so we have Terry asks, how do you account for all the artifacts found in cave four since the units overlap those excavated during the 1960s? Oh yeah, um, good question. I've, so integrating our work with Stephen Bedwell's has been pretty tricky. We've definitely been both working with the museum collection that's housed at U of O, um, redating some of the features and the samples that they took then, but also our excavations themselves really helped in integrating that because uh, there were some maps available, but we were still not completely clear exactly where the excavation units were. So cross-cutting those and finding the walls of Stephen Bedwell's units from the 1960s really helped us um, map exactly where he had excavated. And when we did that, we were able to take um, the levels that he recorded and we could match them up with the levels we excavated. So that way we could at least um, know which tools he found matched up with the elevations of what we were finding. And so it's not perfect because we're excavating in a lot smaller levels than they were and using, you know, different methods. Um, so, you know, our, our methods are not the same, but we have been able to really integrate those. And what he recorded, where he saw those peaks and the artifact types he was seeing really aligns well with what we were seeing. So that's kind of how we've been able to integrate that and be able to consider what they did in the 60s and get a more holistic view of Cave 4. I'm not sure if that fully answers what, what you were asking, but let me know if, if not. Yeah, it looks like they proposed a follow-up question. Um, are you mapping finds with other sites across the continent? Yeah, um, I definitely am getting more and more interested in taking a continental perspective and seeing how, you know, these patterns that we're seeing at Conley Caves and in the Great Basin um, fit with and compare to other sites across the entire continent. Because, you know, like I said before, it's definitely clear that it's a lot more complex than we ever thought. And I don't think that there's going to be one description of what people were doing that's going to fit everywhere. You know, I mean, people were clearly very well adapted to the different places that they were living and very knowledgeable about the resources in those areas. Um, and so I really want to keep comparing different sites of similar ages in different geographic regions to see how people adapt to um, different places and also how people are adapting to the changing climate at this time. So yeah, the ways that we're doing that is trying to kind of compile information, you know, technological information, dietary information and radiocarbon dates, all these things um, from sites throughout North and South America into a big database. Actually, Richie Rosencrantz and Jeff Smith at UNR are really working on this hardcore right now um, so that we can get a, a more continental view of what's happening in the Younger Dryas. Fantastic. Anyone else out there have any questions this evening? Uh, I see in the chat, someone asked about, um, if the cave size was modified, it says, um, did you find modifications to the cave size or were the caves unmodified? And um, we haven't really seen the caves themselves being like chipped away or anything like that. Uh, I actually didn't really talk about this, but the caves themselves were eroded by pluvial Fort Rock Lake. And so that's why we have those rounded cobbles at, at the bottom of it. And so that's kind of how the shelters formed. They also, a lot of them have really big cracks 
above the openings where water has percolated through over time. And that's also kind of eroded the shelters as well. But other than those things, we haven't really found any significant modifications to the shelters um, themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, any other questions? Caitlin, Caitlin yeah. this is Jim Kaiser. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much for an incredible lecture. We, uh, I, I just was thrilled the whole time through. Uh, it's amazing what you guys are finding. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. And, you know, um, we really want to be able to share this with people and, you know, let everyone know what we're doing and make this information accessible. So thank you so much for having me to talk and for listening to this. And like I said, um, please always never hesitate to get in touch. And also, if you want to come visit us, get in touch. We'll be out there this summer. So, yeah. All okay. Right. I think uh, I think that's it. Paula, are you going to wrap this up? Yes, I was. So, yeah, okay. drum roll. <laughs> right? Is the curtain closed? All right, everybody. So until next time, take care. <laughs>